Jonathan Blow is back to explore the hidden conflicts within game design, and to touch on his own games a little more, should time allow. Welcome back to the No Frauds Club, Jonathan. And I wanted to get started right in the thick of things, as usual. I'm going to ask you about hidden conflicts, as I mentioned. Uh, this has been something that has given me a lot of pause and really just a lot of uh, friction whenever I'm trying to appreciate the products that we already have to appreciate now in the gaming space. And it's also been a running theme in our past episodes here where we've talked about like the dis the disconnect between narrative and player experience uh, is like the basic level, but you and I both know this can go a lot deeper than that. You actually have a talk that you referenced, I believe, although not in name, uh, in the previous episode. You said you did gave a talk in 2008 called Conflicts in Game Design. And I end, wound up watching that back after the last time you were on. You used a term that I think maybe you've coined, I've never heard it anywhere else, called dynamical meaning. And I interpreted this as meaning, uh, the meaning that a system communicates to a player who interacts with it. So if you're interacting with a system, it's telling you something, it's giving you some feedback. That sort of dynamical meaning is like unique to something that you can interact with. And so that's really like the strength of games, but it can also be the sort of nail in the coffin if you're trying to do something that doesn't work a lot well with that. Has your conception of this evolved? Is this still something that you would consider as a central pillar uh, or central design pillar for your the way that you design games? Yeah, I would say so. But with, um, you know, with the slight modification that, uh, you know, what I was talking about in that speech um, was games that are especially narrative heavy, right? Where, for example, they're doing a single player story and that is a large component of like what is being delivered to the person playing the game, right? And uh, to date, since that speech, I haven't really made a game like that, where there where the story component is so heavy. And uh, one of the reasons for that, right? That's not a mistake. Um, it's because I don't like how those things often come out. And if given a choice, you know, in terms of what to actually design in order to make the best thing possible, I tend to focus on the actual game parts of the game, right? And then do whatever I think narratively uh, works with what I'm trying to do on the other side. And that's been so far my way of avoiding this kind of conflict. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's sometimes that's pretty minimal. So in The Witness, there's not a lot of narrative. Uh, that's explicit, right? There's definitely some idea of what's going on in the background, but it's like extremely backgrounded, and I was just fine with that uh, for that game. For the new game that we're working on, they're probably, you know, we're still figuring this out, but there's probably a much heavier, much more explicit story component. Um, and it's a little bit of a, you know, that brings up this challenge again of like, okay, how do you make sure this works harmoniously with the rest of the game <clears throat> but i feel like that's not really going to be a problem for this game it's much more the problem is just like how to actually make it good right which is um you know i actually don't remember so i gave i gave two speeches in a row at that same conference i did one in 2007 and one in 2008 and i think they covered some of the same territory uh but you know Maybe a lot of this is in the 2008 one. Um, you know, I spent some time talking about that I don't really think it's a mistake that games and stories are not necessarily very good because if you look at the tools that a storyteller, like who's writing a novel or, or a film or something, if you look at the tools that they have to use to make stories good, games don't actually have a lot of those tools, right? They're removed by virtue of the fact that it's an interactive medium. And so um, it, it, this is just a thing that, that weirdly I don't see people talking about very much. Um, who, and I guess it's just, well, there's so much money in these you know, single player story games and why would we complain about something that's making so much money? Uh, but you really are kind of hamstrung if you're trying to write a story for a thing like that relative to somebody who's just writing a film because a film is is very, you know, I don't want to go repetitively into what all these things are necessarily, but um, just think about how much more control you have over a film than a game about things coming across the way that you want and how effective that might be for storytelling, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, I do th think it's still an issue. Um, because I haven't been working in a story-heavy mode, 
I'm not sure even that my thought on these matters has progressed very far <laughs> beyond what it was. Like, I think I still pretty much think the same thing, um, which also means that I haven't seen a lot of people elsewhere in the industry really attack this problem seriously either, because otherwise I would have played those things and said like, oh, you know what I think now is this other thing did a good job. I don't, I don't have examples like that. Well, I'll throw a few thought examples anyway at you. And this yeah. is another topic we'll get to at the end of the, or throughout this conversation is the fact that there's not too many, like you're saying, there's not really any examples of the good thing or the better thing in this exact field. There's really only a lot of counter examples, what not to do. And you raised this point in the last appearance as well. Okay. So something that I want to throw at you as an idea is obviously I'm an RTS guy. I'm building an RTS right now. It's not the only genre I appreciate, but that's what we're working on. And so mm -hmm. I've, you know, a lot of RTS games are, are, as popular, if not more popular for their single player, as much as they are compared to their multiplayer. And that involves a single player campaign with a linear story usually. And it's like this narrative that you experience and you have these characters. There's a load of conflicts there. I mean, not the least of which is a lot of these uh, games will employ the concept of a hero unit, which is supposed to be a character, but they're acting as a specific special unit that might just fail you if they die. And it's weird to think about that because when, as an RTS player, you're sacrificing thousands, if not more than that of units across your whole campaign. And why is this one guy have to be different. So that's like a disconnect on a mechanistic level with what's being told in the narrative. So that's one example of it. But yep. one way that I've decided to like, so basically those are systems to avoid as far as I can tell. And one area where I think we can still reclaim or perhaps explore a different realm of storytelling within this genre is you actually leverage what the player is experiencing for the most part in the game, which is, I believe you've maybe done this without putting this kind of verbiage uh, or attaching this, these kinds of words or concepts to it. But it's like, when you're playing an RTS and you're going up against an opponent, if you imagine a 1v1 and you're playing against a human player, then their personality shines through in the way that they play. If they're really aggressive, then that means that they're like confident probably, or they're like, you know, trying to put you on the back foot. Maybe there's a little bit of psychological manipulation there. If they're not, if they're really safe, it might be that they're not confident, or maybe this is the way that they can be confident. They can like get up to the higher levels, more power, et cetera. And then, you you know, maybe then if you don't pressure them enough, if you're not the aggressive one, they're calling out to you to do that. Otherwise, they're just going to eventually run over you. So these are just various examples of how that is telling a story. Like there is a narrative unfolding there. It's just one that's not done by the developers explicitly. They might set the ground rules when they give you, say, a, a, a AI controlled or a computer controlled opponent, and they have these personalities. Uh, but you can ad adapt this to fighting games or you can adapt this to shooter games where you're fighting against a military that might be throwing like crazy amounts of seemingly like kamikaze style troops at you where they don't really have much of a care for their own their own life or worth. They're just going to keep hunting you relentlessly. That tells a story. And the problem is that most of the time this kind of story doesn't actually jive with what's supposed to be happening, right? You might go up against an opponent have a really easy time with it. And then the dialogue is like, oh, that guy was so hard. I almost didn't beat him. When meanwhile, you're like yeah. barely breaking a sweat and the inverse can happen where it's more rare, but you can imagine like, oh yeah, this is easy. And meanwhile, you're like bent over the controller sweating profusely. Like, oh, I can't believe I almost lost that again for the 10th time in a row or whatever. So this can happen. And I feel like games are really primed, especially if they have these mechanical competitive elements to them where there is this like victory and defeat and they're clearly defined and you can lose and you can win and you want to be the guy who wins. So does this is the kinds of things you have to do. It feels like this can be, this is like primed for storytelling material, but nobody's really explored it. What, what do you have to say on those concepts? Yeah, okay. So this is a place where I would like to get a little more specific about, about the term story, which like usually, usually I don't like, you know, bike shedding about definitions because I don't think it's productive, but I do, I do think that there is something specific to say here because it's just so common, right? Um, okay. So you were just saying, that the the dynamic to restate what I heard you say, right, is like, hey, in this, for example, the natural dynamics of player competition that happen when you pit two people together in an RTS, right? As a player who is invested in the game, you're going to be observing how your opponent behaves, and you're going to be building some ideas in your head about who they are and how they're behaving, because that's kind of what you need to do to win, right? Like, if you don't do that, you're sort of at a severe disadvantage. So it's, it's in some sense part of the game, even, to do this thing. But even if it weren't part of the game, it's like what human beings do naturally, right? Is like, I'm forming this picture of who I'm playing against, and, and oh, this was surprising that they did, because it differed from what my picture had been so far, and all these things, right? And you're also saying that that is... Um, and I think I think this should be obvious 
to people who think about it, but again, people don't think about it enough, um, that this is very easily a source of discordance or conflict with the presented story parts of the game, right? Because I don't know, like, yeah, like maybe maybe it's trying to be all like Battlestar Galactica, like dark drama, we're barely surviving, and you're like, no, I just kicked that dude's ass, right? Um, I think all, all of that is completely true. I don't, though, think that that makes the thing that is happening when you're playing the other person and picturing who they are, I, I don't think that that's storytelling of any kind, right? It's just other, it's other mental stuff that happens that can easily be in conflict with storytelling. But, but to me, when, when we say storytelling, it's a very specific thing. And the reason why I like to keep, and, and I'm not even saying you have to agree with my definition. I just want to say where I'm coming from. So when, when I use the word storytelling, it's, um, it's to mean a very specific process of there's some fictional events that like happened, right? And I'm relaying them to you. I'm communicating them to you in a way that leverages these arts of storytelling, which involves picking the interesting parts and dropping out the boring parts and like focusing on focusing on certain aspects of what happened because that's like the point of the story, right? Usually a story has like a point. It's not just saying a bunch of facts, right? It, it, you're saying facts for a reason and that reason um, can have different kinds of motivations behind it. It could be you know, artistic, it could be moralistic, like whatever, right? But so, um, and the reason I just like to be very specific about that definition is because, I, you know, I've been around in the games industry for a long time. And in the, in the dark old days, uh, like even before that 2008 speech, like if you go back to the early 2000s or even the 90s, even, the, and you still hear a little bit of this, but like, the space of like thinking intelligently about video games was like colonized by all these academic people who didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And there was this whole argument and look, look this up. If you haven't heard of what I'm talking about, there was like this group called the ludologists and this group called the narratologists. And they were having all these stupid arguments that had very little to do with like actual video games. Right. Um, but the narratologists were about saying essentially that, so they started out being like, oh, the story is the important thing and where the meaning comes from. And this is an extremely uncharitable relation of what happened there. But um, it, as time went on, it sort of morphed into this thing where they define everything interesting as being story because that's what they care about, right? And so I would, you know, I would go to universities and like try to talk to people and they would be like, oh, but you know, when you're in the first person shooter and you beat the boss and you feel really good about it, that story. And I'm like, no, that's something that happened. And you might tell a story about that to your friend, right, where you emphasize the cool parts of the battle and whatever. And that's a story. But the thing that happened is a thing that happened. It's not like a story. And um, that became very frustrating to me because all these people, um, they've been taught weirdly in school that like every single thing in the universe actually is story, at which point you can't say anything, right? Because like, like once you define something to mean everything, you can't use the term meaningfully. But anyway, okay. So um, really, I just wanted to rant about academia not knowing what they're talking about well i did you know you probably picked this up but i deftly or maybe not so deftly i skirted around the idea of saying the term ludo narrative dissonance because i do know yeah. the etymology and that is basically one way to describe the the disconnect between narrative and the player experience or the story and what the player is experiencing yeah then you know even back in that talk you referred to which was a long time ago now i probably referred to that term a couple times because people knew what it was but like I don't really like using it um, because I think it has too specific of an idea about what's going on somehow. Like it's trying to be too scientific of a term for too specific of a thing. Whereas I think like games are pretty complicated and there's like a lot going on, you know, like the thing, even the thing that you described about, you know, picturing what your opponent is like, 
that's not in the narrative, right? It's also not in the rules of the game, right? It's it's just something you're doing as at a meta level as a player of the game. It's like an emergent phenomenon, right? And a, a good game designer will know that this happens, but it's like it's not in the rules of the game that like step five is you think about how your opponent is behaving and draw conclusions. That's just not how it goes. And so I just I, I think it's helpful to if all game designers just sort of take a step back and have some kind of beginner's mind where they like look at what's actually happening and not try to draw too many conclusions about it. Which is why, yeah, like sciencey sounding terms like that, they just bother me. Sure. So I did yeah. want to. So th there is a point that I can fire back on immediately, which is one of the sure. things that you reference, and I'm glad that you used this term because it made me think of this conversation I had with Casey Muratori on this channel. We talked about his plans for interactive fiction, and you said yeah. that you use the term fiction in in your description of why you don't feel like like it's a, a facts, like rattling off facts, but the facts are actually interesting and they form some sort of coherent story that is told for lack of a better term or some sort of pattern that is some way true or interesting. The thing that I think of from this is that if you're gonna have a narrative in a game, then I almost feel like the idea of the player sitting down and like playing the game and then having a cutscene tell them about what happened in the story is sort of like admitting that you can't combine the two and you're specifically cordoning off territory where this is just the story catching up to the gameplay. And then we can have a gameplay catch up to the story in the next section. And you yourself mentioned this uh, might have been in the uh, second appearance again where you said that like you can almost consider it uh, that you, you drew the lines of like uh, story pacing. And you're talking about like TV shows that were interrupted by Coke ads and stuff. And you're saying like, yeah, yeah we have ads in the game, but it's gameplay and they let the last 30 minutes and like they completely interrupt the flow of the, of the story. So I do understand why you're, and it's good that we get our definitions down pat. So I do understand where you're coming from, but, uh, and I do think it's good that we, we get all of that stuff out early on in the conversation, because this allows me to fire back and say, what if the story is not actually determined? And this sounds like it's crazy and it sounds like it takes a lot of work, but I have an argument to say that maybe it doesn't. And maybe this will end up being like, maybe you'll think that, oh, you kind of like fake the depth, but it's not fully there. So I'm interested in your take on it. And it's basically that if you set the ground rules as the designer and you say, here's this player, this uh, commander in an RTS or this military, this faction in, a, in an FPS, and they throw enemies at you and they do certain tactics or whatever. Now the player, it's the player's job to actually make a difference in the world and they do that and that what their actions are, are and their like struggles, if they struggled at all, if they just breeze through, is somehow reflected in the, the dialogue that happens and maybe also reflected in what f functionally changes in future levels or future encounters with that same entity that they fought. And so you can imagine in an RTS context again, uh, you're fighting a, an opponent, you handily dispatch them, Next time they come back and they've, they're still them, they're still themselves in terms of how they like to play, how they like to organize their military, but they've done something fundamental that operates in a way that is now better against what you defeated them with. Or they've studied you over the course of the next missions and then they've come back with another game plan. And if you imagine that that's happening, then I feel like that is, the reason why I would say that that's priming the game, like the, the, the genre is primed for storytelling that's just not there yeah. is because at that point, the player is telling a story and like they're, the fact that they are, are rattling off by beating the enemy handily is this guy was a pushover. He didn't even bother touching me. Like he was, he couldn't face me. I was way better than him. And so yeah. you could imagine if you were to write that in a narrative, like a book or a movie, you would say that, like you would write a scene where this guy instantly, immediately easily dispatches from some dude. And then he comes back and he's like trying to get, you know, go for the, the king again. And that, this time he's not going to miss. So that's sort of the angle I'm coming at it from where it's almost like a collaboration between the player who's playing it and the whoever's writing like the framework. And ideally developers would be able to like understand as many possible permutations and then like make sure that the ones that are possible are all the ones that they consider valid, which would be like, don't like make a mockery of the game somehow by like trouncing everybody infinitely, like make my game competitive enough or challenging enough so that that doesn't happen. Uh, and so this is something that I, that inspires me or motivates me to like really show where everybody else has gotten it wrong in specifically the RTS genre. But I think it's like a test case that you could adapt on everything else where you're not just playing through a Simon Says or being a cameraman. Like I go back to Half-Life 1 for this example a lot. And it's like, and I guess Half-Life 2 is probably even more so where I call it the cameraman syndrome because really you're like a viewport and you're catching good shots. There's a scene in Half-Life 2 where 
you're fighting against the giant tall striders, I think they're called. You have a rocket launcher with limited ammo, but yep. they keep spawning them in over and over again. And you, the only way to actually progress in the level is to move to some invisible trigger volume that like changes the level and destroys terrain. And it's something you couldn't have understood that was happening. The striders never do that before dynamically. Obviously that was yep. a 2004 game. You wouldn't expect that necessarily. So it's like something that you have no idea about. You have this very limited precious resource that you can take them out when you find them in the wild, so to speak, and not a scripted sequence, but you have to catch this action exactly as the developers intended. So your actual performance doesn't matter. Like really it could have, I could have watched that on a let's play on YouTube and the same result would have happened because it's like determined. So what I'm, arguing for or what I'm pro propositioning as story is like the counter to that. It's the player does tell a distinct story. So when you sit down and play my game, you're going to have not just a different experience, but like the narrative will be functionally different the more you go through. So does this clean it up or do you still think I'm coming at it from a place where I'm not fully grasping what your storytelling definition was? No, I, I mean, I have two things to say about this broadly speaking. And, and one of them uh, doesn't have that much to do with the broader subject, but it seems important to say, which is just so all the stuff that you were saying seems pretty familiar because this is the kind of thing that people used to talk about in, in like the late 90s and early 2000s when people still kind of believed in game design. Like as an industry, like people would be talking about stuff like this that they wanted to do. And then somehow this great disappointment happened where not very much of this happened. And, you know, obviously, because otherwise you wouldn't be talking about doing it now, right? And so. Um, and I don't know why. Uh, I'm not. I'm not using that to suggest that that this wouldn't work, right? If you tried hard and did a good job on it, I think it's more like, you know, maybe games. This was a time when games were just becoming much more complicated anyway, because the rule sets were getting more complicated, and like 3D was happening, and and all this stuff. And then also, it was just becoming a much more successful industry, which again means everybody's chasing these ever larger amounts of money and like you know the stuff you described is is not obviously the path to making the, the highest grossing game although if if you succeed in making something that's an experience that people are looking for that they haven't gotten then actually that is the way that you make a hit game right but but people just never see it that way in advance for some reason uh, when they're trying to like plan financially. So so that's one thing is that like game designers used to be saying this stuff all the time and like now they don't. So what happened there? Um, but uh, the other thing is, okay, so it's a it's a hard problem to do this, right? Like once you start sitting down and saying, okay, how do we actually make this work? Like like if we want the enemy to come back with you know, a tactic that addresses what you did. We have to like recognize what you did, right? Like as as someone pre-authoring the story, we have to recognize what are all the ways that you might win, and like maybe not miss that many of them, right? Or certainly not miss the most likely ones, because because if I if I put all this work in to do this thing about the enemy responding to your thing, but it only happens in like thirty percent of games, that's not necessarily very good right like 30 percent of players experiences i mean right so um so you know that doing that is a little bit of a challenge right making that work um and then you know making it work in a multi-step way i mean maybe this only happens once but like it kind of seems like the sort of thing where you would want it to compound over over an arc right and and then you have this question about like things happening in different orders and like, do they compose correctly and all that, right? Okay, but but it, it's, you know, you also, you know, one can see the roadmap that you would use to start working on this, right? Um, I think the thing to observe is, like I was saying before though, there are storytelling techniques that you simply don't get to use, right? Um, so, uh, like one of them, one of the most obvious ones is like foreshadowing, right? Because because you don't know what's going to happen later. I mean, foreshadowing means you're forcing what is going to happen later, right? Which means you're not letting it be an outcome of player experience, right? And so I think if we're trying to do dynamically generated story, 
we just have to be very aware that we're leaving that one. Like that's a technique for those people. It's not available to us, right? And there's there's actually a few things like that, I think, right? Um, and, and some of them are are maybe not that obvious, uh, or maybe let's just say some of them are a lot harder. Like how do you? And again, I'm going to say stuff that's kind of like stupid hack writing, but it's just to get it's just to get the idea across. And like actual good writing is a little bit better than this, right? But it resembles it, which is like how do you make characters that people care about, right? Well, part of that you have just as much access to in a game, right? If you're making a fictional character in an RTS, they can have some background that's interesting, that's mysterious or that people empathize with or something, right? But then part of it in traditional storytelling is what happens over the course of the story, right? How does this character like react? And then how... Like, are they a different person at the end of the story and to what degree, right? And that last part of it, it's like, okay, well, if we're doing full dynamic story, we're sort of talking about trying to do that. Like, these actions are going to change the character in some way, in a way that'll be interesting. But we're sort of off the map of traditional storytelling at that point. Because in traditional storytelling, you decide a priori what is going to happen to the character and why that's good and you make it all like work out and you obviously can't do that if the story has to react to the player and so you end up doing a different thing and and this is the opportunity this is on the one hand it makes it a challenge but it also makes it an opportunity for games to do things that other media never have been able to do right which is well if what people respond to is characters changing in interesting ways can we come up with ways for that to happen that are interesting, but that are dynamic outcomes? And to what extent does dynamic outcome mean random thing we don't really care about? Or to what extent can it mean actually shining a spotlight on this piece of the possibility space that we hadn't thought about before? And then, but actually us caring about the outcome, right? This seems like a pretty abstract question, but I think it's central to do people care? Okay, you know, okay. So we know that people care about traditional stories when they're good, because we have lots of examples of well-told stories that people were really into, right? I mean, if, if there's a dynamically generated story, there's sort of two separate questions, like do people care about it and is it actually important <laughs> like those are two separate questions because you're you're asking how how accurate are people in terms of what they choose to care about which we know sometimes the answer is not very right but um <clears throat> uh like that's an interesting there's at least several tiers of question one is like what are the technical and design implementation decisions that I make in order to get this to happen at all in a way that where it succeeds most of the time in, in most players' games, right? And then it's like, okay, and then is that good in a way analogous to how a traditional story is good, or is it just like a thing that I implemented, right? Um, but it is it is a very challenging space. And I know, you know, I know Casey is doing some stuff there, but I don't even know exactly what he's doing. So I can't really speak to how that addresses anything that I was just saying. Well, I have a couple of ideas that might address some of it or might expose further that like your um, concern or your estimation of the challenge finds greater purchase. So the first thing that yep. I'll say is you mentioned that, so you mentioned a few things that I think are like your from your standpoint, it it's like a binary like this didn't happen. At, like you were talking about the game designers talking about this in the '90s mm -hmm. and like this is stuff we want to do, and it didn't happen. Uh, and without like trying to be a gotcha guy, I'm just saying yeah. there are you. So you talked about Elden Ring in the last episode. You said it represents an incomplete step to showing a, what a great game could be or what games could do with world building and immersion inside a world sure. that is like fantastic and unmatched in any other medium. 
I would say yeah. incomplete step is a perfect way to describe this exact mechanism that I'm talking about, because there have been plenty of games where, you know, I mean, like a simple, very, very simple stuff that's not really related to story or narrative is like you shoot your teammate by accident and they say like, hey, don't do that or whatever. And then it's like in Counter-Strike, even the bots will say this. So uh, that's a case where it's like, okay, well, there's something different that's happening as a response to the player. And the way that this gets extrapolated in my mind is that this is an incomplete step because if you apply the same idea, you don't necessarily, like, again, this is where it might seem fraudulent. You don't necessarily have to completely change every aspect of what the narrative would at the end of the road be. Like you imagine a 10 mission long campaign in an RTS context and, or any game context. And in, in, in my model, instead of being 10 missions long, it's, it's probably 10 missions long always. But depending on the outcomes, you play 10 different missions or like, you know, the last half of the campaign is different or there's like certain points where you could imagine like a flow chart and it expands like this branch makes you branch off to this mission and then maybe you come back. But still the mission you come back to that the, the other guy got to when he played a different way is somewhat different. Like you can have permutations within the missions themselves where it's like a different ally is there or no ally is there or something. So you can imagine all of these different things that are like. In some ways, they're obviously gameplay mutations, but they're also ways that b the narrative is embodied in a different way through the gameplay. So you not having an ally is going to feel very different than you having an ally, especially if that ally is like communicating with you, which most of the time they never do. And you could imagine a line where he's like, I'm gonna take this expansion. I'm gonna attack this enemy specifically. I'm gonna try to get this army comp. If you're without that, suddenly you're like alone. You're more solitary. Maybe it feels suffocating in some way that you all, you don't hear any dialogue at all in those places where you would otherwise. And it's like, wow, I mean, maybe this is like actually a theme that's like being encapsulated by the fact that I'm not, there's an absence of something and that is something. Um, but the, you know, so there's ways that you can imagine this. The other thing you mentioned is uh, foreshadowing and other mechanics that uh, of like good narrative storytelling, good traditional storytelling, where maybe we have to leave behind. And I think it depends on your scope too, because for example, if I know that in like an upcoming expansion pack, I'm gonna add a new race, but I don't like, I want I want to tease that by foreshadowing their forthcoming inclusion. That's something I can do in any mission. Like it doesn't have to be a branching one or what have you, but it definitely does matter in the sense that like you're talking about, you can't foreshadow like a, a definitive thing. You could foreshadow the possibility. And then when it doesn't happen, it's like, you know, so you gave the Chekhov's gun example in the last episode. You mentioned, oh, hey, here's like, if you don't fire this gun off in the third act, then it, it happens. Well, you could also imagine like a conflict about the gun, but it's not exactly that. So you like, I'm not sure what the RTS example would be here because it's like a very different genre. And this is also something I think is an advantage to me is I've been forced to think about completely different ideas of storytelling construction because mm -hmm. RTS stories don't like people have tried to have like personal drama and the stuff that happens in like smaller scale stories. And it just falls completely flat because why would you care about like a love story between like Raynor and Kerrigan or whatever in Starcraft when like you're talking about the fate of the entire galaxy and there's like some dark God coming and it's like, it, this is so out of whack and I don't understand why she turns into a chicken at the end of the story. But like that happens and, and it's really confusing and it doesn't find any purchase at all. So I, I, I've been thinking for a long time in a completely different headspace of like, these are the stories that do work. I have to leave out all this other stuff. I have to think about characters as like, in some ways, yes, they're the, their own character, but especially if it's like the first introduction of somebody to like their faction or their race, they almost have to be like a, a mascot or some sort of like, you know, like when, when the queen is there and, and she's like the, um, I forget what the term is, but it's like a, a stand in for like the cultural stand in that sort of like embodies what, the best and brightest of this, of this faction or something of this nation in mm -hmm. this case. So you almost yeah. can kind of conceptualize them like that. And that's very different than a normal character for sure. So I've already had to think about this very differently, but I think you could foreshadow. I think you could use these things. And I think you've already started to see these examples where any c case where you have like, um, the concrete example I'll give you is undertale, which I'm not sure if you've played. I don't really rate the game. I especially think that it's like an, a very incomplete step because it's pretty binary and that like you either kill anything or you kill nothing and that like de determines one of the endings you get. But you can imagine any game that has like a different ending, a good ending, a bad ending, depending on the player's actions, could be construed as this sort of branching or player uh, interaction. It's just that they're picking from predetermined choices and in a way you're always doing that in a single player game, even one that I'm talking about. But the predetermination is like very blasé. It's not very deep. There's not really a way for you to like influence multiple factors where I can have this ally in this mission, but lose that ally in the next mission or something. You know what I mean? Like there's not really ways for you to interface with multiple different conduits. It's really just like, it's like the Undertale example where if you go on the 
there's like genocide and then I forget what the other run is called, but it's like one is like you kill everybody. One of them is you don't kill anybody. And then depending on that, like that's going to change your ending. That's very binary and it's not very interesting at the end of the day. And they're not really, that, that, that would be an incomplete step in my estimation. So does this added explanation give you any more thoughts on like how you might actually put this into practice? Does it sound more doable when I break well, it down like that? Not really. I mean, so, okay, to go to, back to the, the broad topic of incomplete step, right? Um, the problem is that the incomplete steps that have happened are, you know, less than 1% of the distance that needs to get covered, let's say research and development wise by the games industry to get to this kind of like more dynamic story that's difficult to do. So, you know, you brought up the example in the beginning of, you know, you accidentally shoot a, an AI teammate and they say, hey man, watch your fire or whatever, right? And like, I, I can't even really agree that that's a step toward dynamic story in any way because there's no um there's no like causal chain at all in any way it's like it's literally almost a just a sound effect that happens right it's like we're, we're trying to make our game a little more realistic so what happens if you shoot a dude on your team we don't want him to die okay we'll do this other thing like it doesn't go any distance toward and therefore, then this happens, and therefore, then that happens. Now, there are some games that did a little bit more. So, like Deus Ex 1, for example, had more in this direction about, like, you know, because that game was actually working, you know, quite hard on making a more dynamic story, but it was doing it in this way that wasn't very systemic, right? <clears throat> it's essentially at its core, like, adventure game like in the sense that there's a bunch of if statements and you know we run these if statements to determine what happens but that game was a little bit interesting because it is a little more non-linear in the way the if statements are structured right um but i just you know an actual so you could imagine some holy grail fully dynamic story that comes out great all the time right and just every everything is taken into account and all that. And that's obviously very difficult, right? And so it's a reasonable thing uh, as a designer to start doing the kind of thing that you said, right? Which is like, okay, how do I structure things to make this more doable, but still like rewarding and good and nice and interesting within the structure that I'm laying out, right? And um, I, I agree that that's a totally reasonable way to approach this kind of design um what i would just say is that you know historically there were some notable attempts in terms of that kind of structure you know deus ex being one of them and then they just sort of got left behind because nobody cared right um you know and and so maybe that just means nobody ever did them well enough or what um but i don't So I, you know, I don't, I don't wish to say that incremental steps aren't valuable. Like I do think that a lot of the time, that's the way you solve a problem. Is you, this is, I mean, this is how programmers like solve all problems, right? Is you, you have a seemingly really big problem, and you break it into a bunch of smaller problems, and then you solve first the smaller problems that you see a way to approach, and the other ones might seem hard, but then maybe after you've solved some of those other smaller problems, you have more context with which to reapproach the things that seem too hard in the beginning and and somehow you know good programmers especially manage to use this to do very difficult things and i do think that that also works in design it's just to say that i'm not that impressed with what games have historically done in terms of the distance that they have covered toward a dynamic story scenario so the immediate follow up that i have is I agree that like, you know, games like Deus Ex were the, maybe the first incomplete step, if you want to call it that. But I, so I, like the last point I'll linger on this because this does branch out into some other related topics is you gave another example in the previous answer, not this one that you just gave me, which was that the, you know, character has like something that's satisfying about them is how they change over the story. I almost feel like 
even though you are, again, picking from some element of predetermined stuff, like it's not like AI generated, which we'll talk, talk about later. It's not like crazy, you know, branching paths that are like super dynamic where like the developer themselves doesn't even understand how it, how it works or comprehends it, right? So it's not a black box like that. But what it is, is like if you make it suitably deep, then a character who exits the story five missions in versus 10 missions in might exit the story tr tragically or might exit the story by... Uh, some sort of betrayal or something. And then by virtue of that, they're no longer on your team or what have you. And you can imagine cases where that actually, again, it very much changes what the character is, but it does so in a similar way to, to you could imagine in your own head, if this was different, you know, if I didn't watch Knight Rider as a kid, where would I be now, right? It's like all of these different things that might be branching out in that sense, where it's like, mm -hmm. what is this, what is, what could this result in? So I almost feel like it's, something again that like is kind of unique. You, you saw some of this in Choose Your Own Adventures, like you said. Uh, you saw some of this in like, oh, the character like responds this way to this stimulus. It's not usually the same thing because usually life isn't like that anyway. Uh, but you can imagine like, oh, if if X equals Y, then Z occurs. But Z is like, like it, it really does depend on on the flow chart that you took to get to that point. And so if a character concludes this, their act in, or their arc and they finish their development or they just make a new step in a development, they cross a threshold that is maybe super like a super villain type thing that previously they weren't like that. And maybe they go a different route if you go a different way. Uh, you saw this in RPGs like Knights of the Old Republic, where... Uh, you would have like the opportunity to unlock uh, Jedi power uh, or whatever in a bunch of different characters. Even like your your thief rogue character could do that, uh, which is something that people sometimes didn't find out until their fifth or tenth playthrough or something. So like, there's a lot of depth in that potential situation. Even though I would say that there's a lot of problems surrounding it. So it feels like characters themselves can be a focal point with enough development, with enough care, and like you're saying, hard work and, and effort. Uh, that they can be even more compelling because you know that even if you only play through it once, but you are aware that the system is working this way, then you know that your actions led to a character being different in some way. And that also would extend over to the narrative, to the storytelling in that sense. Does that help concretize it? Or are we still in a, at so, sort of that impasse where you're not really sure how it would be well, conceptualized? I mean, so I, I understand the the thesis or the mission statement right um personally i have never played a game where i agree that that has been successful in the sense and you know this is a place where i differ certainly with a lot of like a lot of people you know like what i'll just pick some straw man series that people are very fanatical about like the final fantasy games okay or whatever sure. i don't know if you like those but no, not particularly um, you know, some people will tell you, oh, my God, the story in, like, Final Fantasy 237 was so amazing. It changed my life and whatever. And I'm just like, no, it's not. It's not a very good story. I'm sorry if you're saying that. I can recommend you some good stories that, that you can go recalibrate your sense of. Like, I think a lot of the time, this is not a very popular thing to say, but, like, Video games are kind of a lowbrow medium a lot of the time. And if you educate yourself, if all your experience is constrained to that medium, you maybe kind of don't know what's possible and you maybe kind of don't know, you know. So so if, you know, if you're saying the stories behind these particular video games are good, and I know that because I've played lots of games with stories, it's like, well, you know, what about these other things that have stories? And of course, the problem is that now, like all movies are Marvel movies that all have the same story anyway, right? So that's not a good example either. Um, uh, but so that's one place where I typically disagree with a lot of people is they say like, oh, I thought this story was really good and I, I'll play a game with a story like that and I'll be like, meh, you know. Um, in terms of, you know, I didn't play uh, Knights of the Old Republic very heavily. Um, I did play it. I don't think I even finished the the campaign once. Um, so, so I can't really. And and it was a long time ago, right? Um, I just remember being like in some hallway and like reflecting blaster blasts. Yeah, that's all I remember about it. <laughs> Um, but I will say, just as a clarification, I also yeah. don't think any game I've played that had a story was a good story or was even like well <laughs> served by it. So when I right. give you well, examples, okay. it's more like the concept within it. Like you were saying in the last episode, imagine the better thing with like the Batman Arkham yes, case. Yes. And this is sort of what I'm doing with this. And so it's it's quite possible that maybe what you're saying 
can be made to happen. That like somehow because you influence the character's arc, you actually care more or it's better or let's even say equally good, but in a different way. Let's we, we don't have to set the bar too high to make this worthwhile, right? Um, maybe that's true, right? I I have not seen it. And you know, I could speculate on some reasons why, but these are literally just speculation, right? Like, like when you have a fiction like a book and some stuff is happening to a character, right? Like the stuff can be really serious that in the fiction, it's very, very serious or whatever and, and turns into, you know, character development in some way. When I'm playing a game, especially if I'm playing a game in a way, like you're saying, where I know that there's certain discrete choices, like I kind of know that those choices are arbitrary. Like games have very well okay the kind of games that present fictional choices to me like bioshock yep. or like mass effect um, mass effect yeah good example the fact that the choices are like presented in this way trivializes them in some sense and i know that they're arbitrary and therefore they can't really be that important Right. And and so that's that's weird. Uh, you know, I'm not sure everybody agrees with me that that's true, but it, it seems pretty obvious to me. And actually, one of the games that I I started like point zero zero five percent of the way making was an RPG where like. You know, you're you're in conversations all the time and like. A bunch of stuff matters and has consequences and you don't actually know exactly what. Right is going to matter and and that actually raises the stakes because anytime you're talking to someone you're like oh man i don't i don't know right as opposed to like dun 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 this is the big choice do you pick a or b or c right so this is a brilliant concrete example because what in my estimation the player's gameplay and their performance is the choice and they they don't know what it well, is well well that's the thing is what I, cuz i was about to say people usually don't care about these things that much in games, but actually like if you're in the middle of playing counter-strike and you're like down by two rounds and you're getting your ass kicked in banana every round, you like really care about that. You're like invested in that way. And I don't play enough RTSs to know the RTS analog, but there surely is one, right? Like those are the things that people really care about way more than like pick this dialogue option, you know? And, and so, um, you know, leveraging that more kind of seems like the way forward for these kind of games. Um, I, I will say that the one story game that I ever played where I felt like, oh man, I'm really going to be careful with the dialogues and stuff because it, it feels like this is important and um, I, I really need to to gauge what I say and all this stuff was the original Kentucky Route Zero, which it turns out all the dialogues are completely useless and nothing happens in the game. But but early in the game, you don't know that, right? And because all the dialogues are useless, the way it's presented is much more ambiguous, right? Because it's like you're just having this conversation with someone. And because it wasn't directly trivialized in that way i felt like i was playing some like really you know important thing and then of course it turns out no it's just it's just like a walking simulator but for dialogue trees right um but that was a really interesting experience for like the first 15 minutes and that's the kind of thing is you you need to communicate it to the player without relying on external marketing where like the dial the trailer says hey look at my game that has you know branching maps or whatever like stuff that happens it's more like i i would imagine a simple example would be that if you are if your objective is to like you know destroy a very specific target and along the way you leave uh, another target that was like optional, but wasn't even marked as an objective. It was just like something you could have interacted with, but you chose not to. And then in the next mission, that object comes back and is like still there and it's an enemy asset. And it's like, oh, now it's like harder. 
And then like maybe you maybe you, you start to think, oh wait, I didn't destroy that in the last mission, and now it's here in the second. And now, like, if I go back, it, like, it's, it gives you a hypothesis. If you're really attentive, it gives you this hypothesis you can test by going back and destroying it. And then, oh, it's not there in the next one. And then suddenly you start to, like, build this. It's it's exactly like the nonverbal communication, really. It's like, we're not having a dialogue line about this. We're not going to beat yeah. the player over the head and say, oh, you didn't destroy this, so no, it's here. Like, we're doing it in a way that it's just, we're presenting the information and we're calling upon the player. We're challenging the player to be aware of that and to put those dots together, right? And that's yeah, something well, that well, a lot of games don't do, right? I, I, I think that that would be a really interesting thing to try and do. <clears throat> there are automatically some challenges there, right? So first, um, there's this tuning challenge to make sure that, you know, whatever these elements are in the game, um, A that enough of them are recognizable in the way that you're talking about, right? Because it's it's like a thesis that enough players will notice this. But, you know, sometimes that's different from how it comes out. Um, but I do think that kind of thing is solvable, right? So, like, you know, uh, this game I did, The Witness, has nothing to do with RTSs, but it has a lot to do with, like, how subtle are the things that you can get players to notice, right? And so after having done that, I'm definitely a believer that like this kind of thing is achievable often by tuning up or down, like how loud are the other things in, in the game. Right. And in fact, that could be, this is a way to introduce difficulty in a non-standard thing is like, how good are you at noticing what's important? Right. There could be some things in the game that are more like the obvious things to notice. Right. And other things that are like, well, if you're really good at like sussing out, patterns on the battlefield then then maybe you'll see this thing right it's a much more interesting way to create difficulty than like more units or more hit points or whatever um so so that's one thing and then the other thing is there is sort of a question of and and i do think you you know i'm i'm raising this because it's an important part of the conversation i think you understand this already because you talked about this a little bit earlier but like you also can't be like dead obvious in the way that this is handled by the game, right? If it always monotonically makes the follow-up level easier because the thing isn't there, then it's like, eh, right? It, it becomes a very simple dead trade-off that you're always making as a designer. Like, well, once the player knows it's always easier to blow up the thing, then we have to make it really hard to blow up the thing. And it's more like, is it worth it? And and then and then you end up, there's this sort of dead kind of design where that all sorts of genres of games end up in, where they end up tuning things because of this problem, they end up tuning things right to the margin where it's barely worth it or not. At which point there's no point in the thing being there. Because if the cost that you pay to get rid of the thing is equal to the advantage that you get from getting rid of the thing, which is where you have to tune it to to make it not the obvious choice then it's not worth doing, right? It's like it's like all these games where like, oh, you have all these weapons or all these abilities, but they're all tuned to be exactly as effective as each other to the greatest extent possible. So like, it doesn't actually matter which ones you use because who cares? Like this is a, a very fundamental um, paradox in game design, right? And so that is present here. Um, so like, how do you make it an interesting evolution of what happened as opposed to like just, oh, now that thing is not there holding down this position. So you can take that position in the next level, like every time, right? Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> so the problem then is, um, and I don't think it's an insurmountable problem because part of what I do these days is just designs that are really big. But you have this problem of, you know, once you start adding more than one of these elements, because if there's just one element like this, maybe it's a little bit trivial. It's not really what the game's about. It's like a it's like a special feature in the game if there's like exactly one of these. But if there's a few of them, now it's a game about being smart and figuring out what's important or whatever, right? And the problem is that it's more than a linear amount of work for the designer because you have to make sure, first of all, that they all work in isolation, but then also in the way that they interact with each other, right? Um, and, you know, the, the way you can start, <clears throat> you can start leveraging tools for that. So the same way that, like, 
branching stories like come to a bottleneck and then rebranch out or whatever, you could have some kind of more systemic version of that. It's just, you know, it's design work that, again, um, you know, designers used to talk about this kind of thing and then they stopped talking about it. Um, but if you're if you're going to try it like that'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, I, I appreciate, first of all, that there's a significant disparity between our familiarity with the genre. So I appreciate you talking about the RTS specific examples, mostly because I haven't thought as deeply about it as it pertains to other genres that I, you're a bit more familiar with, like the shooter genres and stuff. So I, I wanted to. Yeah, last that. RTS I played was probably Total Annihilation. Right. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> So what you've probably not known is like something you mentioned about tuning, the paradox of like when design becomes yeah. deadened is you're talking about like tuning it to the point where it's like just like barely worth it or not. Yeah. And this happens in the, in the StarCraft two campaigns, something that you'll see a lot is there's like oceans of pre-placed assets that are inalienable, right? Like it's always there depending on the difficulty you select, which I think difficulty selection is overrated anyway. But if you were going to have something like that, and then your only choice or your only change is to like increase the number of units per attack wave or something. And like, they're not playing by the same rules. So most RTS AI cheat with money. They know exactly mm -hmm. what the whole map, like they have all these godlike powers that the player doesn't. Sure. So they're playing yeah. a different game fundamentally. And then obviously they have all of these starting assets that the player doesn't have, but they don't use them to immediately wipe out the player, which is what an actual player would do. They like have this weird scripted dance where they're sort of yeah. doing this choreographed, like fake environment where it, you can tell just as a player, like, oh, this is not actually engaging with me. If I was up against a real player, this would be completely different. Uh, or somebody who wanted to win, right? It's like, it doesn't have yeah. to be a human player. It's like you're- Yeah, you're, it's totally just letting you win. In, or even if you ultimately lose, it's like, it's paced yeah. to, to force the designer's idea of what a good experience is supposed to be, right? Yes. And yeah, like, it, that's actually one reason why I don't play this genre yeah. is because I hate that feeling of being condescended to as a player, right? Well, this is a, uh, so you talked earlier about games are a low brow genre or, or medium is something that you had mentioned. Yeah. And I feel like there is a, like the vast majority of people who play games, regardless of platform or, you know, personal taste, probably see them as toys more than they see them as art or potential vectors for art. Right. And this goes back to like, you were talking about definitions for what a story is. It's like, I feel like a lot of people have used that definite, have abused the definition of art as well, where it's like. I mean, technically you can just say that most things are bad art, but I feel like that's kind of devaluing the term of art because like art is supposed to be something that begets a reaction that ideally is unique, that has quality to it, right? And there's like a lot of implicit assumptions that I put into the term art. And that's why I've actually been loath to call video games art usually because most of them don't feel that to me. They feel like there's this, they're, again, they're, they're designed, but like not in a way that's leaving you with choice or engaging with you. It's ways that are condescending. It's ways that are, non-specific and when you're trying to do something like that like the, the very presence of a difficulty selector to me indicates that you couldn't design a uh you were afraid perhaps or unwilling to create a game where there's a threshold and if you can't pass that threshold you got to get better or get out and that's like what the statement we're making right and so i'm not going to have difficulty selection in my games and i'm not going to have yeah. um the idea that like you know, oh, there's adaptive difficulty where like the AI goes easier on you if you lose the mission five times in a row or something. Uh, I've, you know, some people in my thought space are saying like they activate games journalist mode after a certain amount of time, but it's not the games journalist mode you think. It's actually that if you die like a hundred times, then, or, or something like in a, some thing happens where you're clearly not good enough, then the enemies get actually harder, which I think is a bit sadistic, but it's like, okay, you know, you're like, again, these are ideas that are pro like prohibiting audience. And they're saying, if you're like, we only want an audience that is willing to improve or already at this level. And that is going to make a different experience, right? And, and so it's like, challenge is not actually a part of the average designer's repertoire, it seems. They're not really using it as a tool. They're not using it as like, a, it's not in earnest, right? It's like, you know, a bunch of pre-play stuff or it's a bunch of godlike cheating powers or it's a, like unfair advantages stacked into it. And then it's like modulated by making those people dumb so that these actors in a play are not going to actually compete with you. They're just gonna put on a show and you like get the satisfaction, I guess, but it's all hollow of, you know, popping headshots on enemies that are barely moving or something, right? And so yeah, that's it just the feels thing. super fake. Like yeah. the whole, the, the best practices that the genre has adopted just feel super fake and, and lame, right? Yes. Now, so just so people know, it's like, it's not literally true that the last RTS that I played was Total Annihilation <laughs> 1, but like, uh, 
That's the pro that might be the last campaign that I completed. I forget what order like did Homeworld two come after that or something. I but, think so, um, but yeah, it's been a long time either way. I actually the most recent RTS that I actually played a little bit of was I think Homeworld Deserts of Karak, which came out I don't know within the past year. My condolences because I've seen the yeah it was that and... I I did not play it very far yeah um but. But it was, you know, it was definitely just this exactly this same kind of a thing. There was like no new idea. Actually, no, the last RTS that I literally played was two days ago. Okay. It was this Starship Troopers game. That oh, was really okay. Bad. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't played it myself, <laughs> but I remember thinking that maybe there's not that much new ideas in that. If it's uh, no, it, usually it, when it, you have these tie-ins for like genre uh, properties, like there's a tra uh, not Transformers, there's a, a Terminator RTS. I forget oh, what it's called. Okay. That's coming yeah. out or it's already out. And so that's another thing that's like Starship Troopers, which is like modern RTS, right? In air quotes, because yeah. modern doesn't mean anything for RTS games because they haven't evolved. And it's like, yeah. here's another case of that. So I'm just default cynical and I try not to be, but then I play these games and it, nothing good happens. Well, here's the thing though, right? So RTS used to be one of the biggest genres or the biggest genre in games. Like around, you know, the Command and Conquer 1-2 kind of time frame. They were huge, right? They were just the biggest. And then and then somehow we went from that to like essentially complete commercial death of the genre, right? Like it, when there are RTS games made now, they're like smaller games with smaller budgets, right? There ain't no Call of Duty RTS. Um, why? What happened? And people in the industry just sort of shrug and go, well, you know, the genre died out, right? But I actually think it is quite possible to, like, strangle your thing to death by this series of steps that seems like the right step at every time, right? So this whole thing we were just talking about, about how the designs of these things, like, somehow everybody agreed that this general way to design RTSs was the right one where, you know, it's pacing you out and sort of letting you win and, and sort of lying to you about what's happening and all that. And they s sort of think that players aren't going to notice that. And then somehow, mysteriously, the genre dies. And it's like, really? Like, you don't think that people who want to play war games maybe are interested in, like, challenge and actually winning as opposed to pretend winning, right? Um, it's just very weird to me the way that nobody ever questions these. Like people who supposedly are game designers for a living just like don't question these. Things. Well, the, um, yeah, so, yeah, the thing for me that immediately comes to mind when you were asking why did the genre die? And it's like, yes, these campaigns progressively decreased in, I would, I would just say objective quality. If your objective goal is to like, I, I can't. This is a different tirade, like tangent, but people who say that there's no such thing as objective quality to me are missing the point because it's like, if you know what the intent was, then you can grade that objectively to some yeah. degree. Like there's some element yeah. where your subjective experience is gonna color that. But if your objective is to create a real-time strategy environment and have you know thousands of units fighting for dominance over this giant map, and then your map, your game comes out and there's like 10 units per player because you're using 3D for the first time, like Warcraft 3, and you don't really know how to make yeah. engine performance put together. And then you're, you know, that you compensate for that by making battles take like 10 years to resolve because all the units have too much health and too little damage. And all of this stuff happens. And then you also add heroes and, you know, all these other, yeah. I would just say mistakes. Then yeah, that is an objective failure. But another thing that Warcraft 3 spawned was obviously Dota, the Defense of the Ancients, the sort of primordial MOBA, if you ignore the StarCraft custom map. And... <laughs> like MOBAs are like less than half of a game compared to an RTS. Like they take away more than half of the game mechanics and they leave you with something that is also not even a full game if you compare it to like an FPS where you move differently than you shoot. It's like you move and, sh and attack in the same with just yeah. the mouse and stuff. So you're not even really playing yeah. a complete game if your bar of complete game is some games that came before it. But that accessibility combined with the fact that Warcraft 3 itself was not a competitive title, like didn't compete for your time, meant that way more people flocked to this custom map and that eventually spawned like, you know, all of these other offshoots that are simpler games, which I think generally simpler products probably do appeal to a wider audience. But that didn't mean that the genre had to die. It, I think I agree with you that it died because of its concepts. Like it, it, it died on its own hill. It's not, it's not like, oh, a better genre came or, so, or a more accessible genre came or whatever. It's that they, these, they didn't continue pushing the envelope. They pushed it the wrong direction, like off the table. And now it's just a mess.
So it's just very weird to me. It, it not only got pushed in the wrong direction, but like everybody agreed that that was the direction to all push simultaneously, right? It's like, let's all push this off this cliff over here, right? And and not question it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, this is a little bit of a firebomb to throw into chat or whatever. Although actually, I'm sure most of your chat will agree with what I'm about to say, but like hi- highly contentious generally. So, you know, you we we sort of, you know, we're talking about definitions of story, which is not that I'm glad we didn't rat hole on that because it's not that productive of a thing. But then you brought up definition of art, which is like the ultimate yeah, yeah, yeah. terrible rat hole to get into, <laughs> right? And but the reason though, I, I think this is important to the conversation because you did bring up um this idea that people have about you can't judge things objectively, right? And like that is just one of the biggest mistakes that modern Western culture has made, like across the whole culture that's had like incredible ramifications, right? So like just just as a designer of something, like for example, a video game, it's your job to like know what's right and have a strong opinion about that, right? And somehow people don't even understand that. And anyway, so so the reason, you know, one of the reasons why arguing about the definition of art has become so unproductive is that we're actually many decades into this cultural decision we made where some people in academia decided to redefine art in some way that was historically you know different from the way the word had historically been understood and then and then they redefined it several times to the point where like nobody really agrees on what it kind of means and then and then also nobody cares right so you know if you go if you go to the museum of contemporary art in san francisco which is a very high per capita income place where people are supposedly very sophisticated there's nobody in that fucking building right like nobody cares about what's being hung on the walls um and Like, again, the the same way that the people who threw the RTS off the cliff never stop to question about what we're doing, we don't culturally stop and think, like, well, maybe this definition of art that we've come up with isn't very good. And I think there's there's forces that cause us not to do that because... um, because the idea of art that we have now is like, well, anybody can do it and it's all good. And you're not, if if you think particular art is bad, that's just your opinion, man. Right. And like all these things are a little bit true, but the problem is we take them, we assume they're a hundred percent true, um, which leads to a, a devalued definition of the thing. And the problem there are multiple problems with that, but one of those problems is that new people who would be artists, like how do you, if you're a little kid and you're going to do some cool art thing when you grow up, how do you like figure out that that's what you're doing? It's like you somehow absorb all this stuff in your life and it, and, and you realize that this is what you want to do, right? And if we have degraded that mechanism to the point where a lot of people just don't have that trajectory anymore just it doesn't happen for them because they walk through the san francisco museum of contemporary art and they're like this sucks and is stupid and they leave um like we're sabotaging our own ability to make good things right and so i don't know that's that's just a rant on the side but it applies to video games i think because so you know the, the things that you were said, I think, are, are directly applicable to this. Like, um, whether somebody wants to call them design or art or craft, right? I'm a little bit ambivalent as to which word to use there, though. But it's like, look, I've got some ideas of what to do that's interesting. They're different from what has been done and what people are currently doing. And, like, let's try doing this thing. That's That's the most, that's like the lifeblood of actual creativity in in a like let's just say in games for example right that's like what keeps games alive and they're just we don't seem to appreciate that enough 
and there just don't seem to be enough people doing it anymore, which is kind of scary. Like, you know, back, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, when like indie games were kind of blowing up again as a thing, because we got so much more distribution, you know, Steam and all these places, Xbox Live and all that. Um, everybody was like, oh my God, this is going to make games so much more creative again. And like, well, fast forward 12 years and they're not really that much more creative. Like, everybody's just sort of still doing the same stuff. <clears throat> and uh, it's a little bit of a bummer. Like, why? Why? Why are we so bad at like doing new and interesting things? I don't know. Um, now, it's, you know, I don't wish to say that it's all bad because like obviously the fact that distribution is easier to attain for smaller players now than it used to be opens the door in a way that it wasn't open before to doing new and interesting things that then players are able to recognize as new and interesting and it catches on and then people appreciate it and it like becomes a successful thing like that is possible now in a way that it wasn't really uh for a while although honestly the period during which it wasn't possible is kind of short um but like very few people take advantage of that opportunity and it seems like a huge waste. Well, what they're taking advantage of is the opportunity to be like the AAA space or like yes. the the full yes. like full budget space, right? That's the democratization of like Unreal Engine, Unity Engine, Godot, whatever else you might be using. Yeah, but go ahead. But like okay, my business plan is I'm going to compete with a AAA game with 150th or 1/100th of the budget that they have. If that Right. It doesn't sound like a very good business plan unless no, no. you have some other idea. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like we don't have a budget at all. It's like all out of pocket. Yeah. And so we're doing yeah. like we're not going to try to make. Oh, let's do the. Well, it's funny, actually, because I can't really say that with a straight face. I was about to say we're not going to make a Starcraft killer, but we probably are just because our ideas are good enough to stand up on that merit. And like Starcraft doesn't have state of the art graphics. It has graphics that age well because it's 2D instead of 3D. And so if we can at least capture some element of that with our art style, and at this point, graphics don't nearly are not nearly as much of a pull, especially for the audience we're targeting. Like this is the other problem yeah. is that the motivation is not usually the distribution of your ideas. It's like, you know, distribution of players' money into your bank accounts. And that's like one at least significant driving motivator. Obviously, we would like to keep the lights on. And if we can't do that, then we're going to slow progress uh, significantly. But the main idea is just like our hypothesis anyway, and I think your work has proven this obviously in a different genre, is if we create a good thing and it's new and it's serving an enthusiast consumer base that already hasn't been, has been just perpetually starved of quality content, then uh, we will be rewarded for that. And it won't be, we won't have to put in microtransactions and we won't have to abuse like ad adrenaline addiction. And like, you know, you, you gave an example in a different talk about addiction versus sustenance and it's like, or drugs versus sustenance, drugs versus food. And it's like games can do drugs really well, but they can't do food really well. If we give food, then if we provide that as, as part of our game in this analogy, then I don't see why we wouldn't be rewarded. Maybe not in the sense that it's mass appeal. That's not our goal though. Our goal is to create something good and, ideally like the same thing will happen in that sense. We, we don't need a crazy amount of money. I can live off of, I don't even know the calculations. I can't remember, but it's like, you know, less than 20 K a year would pay my bills. I don't need a lot. And so if I can, and the goes, same goes for everybody else on the team, which is a small team. And that's the advantage of this. Like you were saying, like being able to have small players in the space, they can operate on really tight razor thin budgets and, or margins or whatever. And, and then they don't have to worry about it nearly as much, but they can also do great things. And it does feel like, unfortunately that I, I do feel usually that I'm one of the only people, especially in this genre, but just broadly speaking, like most of the independent developers I, I come across, are just trying to chase the dragon of a triple A release, you know? And they're not necessarily yeah. like I whether or not they're financially successful, it's not just not an interesting like rabbit hole to run down, you know what I mean? That's that's the the gist of it that I get. And so, I mean, this kind of goes back to something else that you said. Uh you talked about like games so you don't always like there's something deep within a game that has an idea about it or that offers something good or something that is not offered on offer anywhere else. And it's like, you almost don't understand what that is, even as a designer, unless you've like, you really have to think outside the box and imagine what could be, or you have to run into it yourself, like in some other medium. 
And so you almost like don't understand the message that you're sending until you've sent it in some way. Or at least like, if you do, like it's leading up to release or something, right? And I, you ta- you gave this talk about like, in the last episode, you were talking about Braid and how, you know, you get you got many ideas that could have been their own game, but would have taken you off topic. And it's like, that's the, the kind of vibe that I get is that, a lot of people are, they, they don't, they shut off the idea, the, the, what would you even say? The window for ideas to fall through. They shut that off and they're just like, this is my idea. And so they never generate that. They already fully comprehend what they're sending, the message that they're sending. And so how could it be an exploration? And so you've obviously explored a lot of stuff like nonverbal communication being chief among them is like, there's this in, implicit feel that. Uh, I have when I'm working on something that is going to le- say I'm working on a script for a mission and it leans into something dramatic. It, it te- deals with like really crazy stakes or scale and it uses flowery language and I don't mind being dramatic, but there is this thing in the back of my head where it's not really doubt. It's just an acceptance that there's going to be a market of people who look at that and they say in a game or even at all, like there's this, we are as a culture, not allowing beauty to flourish really. It's like, we, we can't, we're afraid of being deep we're, or, or grandiose or having anything to do with gravitas. And I haven't seen you shy away from this nearly as much. Is this something that you even think about? Or is this just part of the, the like package deal where it's like, if I'm going to explore really interesting ideas in my games, then we have to go into a territory that might alienate some people just by virtue of it being grand. Cause I would just say, I don't even want the people that are going to be alienated to be part of the thing. If they're not willing to explore something grandiose and, and very deep and dramatic, but there is like a kernel of truth to the assumption that maybe you should wait to be grand to like, you have to earn it. Right. And so like, do you feel like it's relatively understandable to earn that? Like, have you figured out a way to earn that grandiose feel or is it just something that you sort of do by feel? Well, you know, <clears throat> when, whenever I am designing something and it has some element of like trying to approach large topics, um, I'm doing that because I'm interested in those topics personally. And because I'm legitimately interested in this thing, that makes it real at least to me, <laughs> and therefore by extension, maybe to some reasonable number of people, right? Um, who, you know, anyone who's anywhere on the same page as me with regard to thinking about some particular thing, um, which automatically removes some of the danger of like being a huge poser or whatever, right? Which, you know, some people will still call anyone that on the internet right but like it's the internet so you expect this um but like it's a it seems to me like a very weird stance even again ignoring terms like art or whatever for a minute It seems like a very weird stance for people to say it is inappropriate for you to be thinking or speaking about some large topic. That's just out of bounds. You you are not because the implication is we're we're here in existence to do some stuff, but there's like a ceiling on what you can ever be expected to think about or, or do. So if you want to, if you want to talk about, you know, how, uh, you know, I don't know how it would be way better if we ran politics in a different way or something that's, that's within bounds. But if you want to talk about like something that, you know, some question about actual reality in some way, that's just way out of bounds. That's just unacceptable. Like, if you put it that way, that's just clearly wrong. Like, that's the way that... Um, like, if you have two societies next to each other but isolated from each other and one of them acts that way and the other one doesn't, who do you expect to be better off a thousand years later? Like... It kind of seems obvious to me, right? 
And so, I mean, apart from questions of maybe you blow yourself up sooner because you're better at doing things, but um, it's just really weird to me to zoom out and observe this kind of hostility at that at that level. Um, but I think it is it is correct that we do have some kind of built-in hostility to you know not only you know oh you get called pretentious for thinking about certain classes of topic out loud but for presuming that beauty is like a real thing for example right as opposed to just your opinion man right um and I, I think, again, <laughs> we've seen where this goes culturally after decades of this, and I think it's obviously an unhealthy place, but we don't stop and really question that. And so, again, I think it's just, it's just the job of, of individual people to do what they can in, in this, what makes sense to them. And if there's a certain tradition that is not in vogue right now, you just carry the torch of that tradition forward anyway. And maybe it'll be a bigger thing later, right? Um, it's like a stoic perspective in some ways. It's just like, put, put it out of your mind that there are going to be naysayers, so to speak, and then just move on. Because like there, there is a function of the naysayer. There's a function of somebody who's like going to critique you for doing that. I guess it might be like yeah. a religious impulse or something where it's like, if you're trying to invoke something that could be on the scale of that, then you might be a fraud. And so we have to like really be judicious with what kind of giant ideas we accept as truth. But like, but that's part of the reason why you explore it. And like you said, like well, societies would explore it instead of necessarily adopting it as, as fact. And so I feel like maybe some people short circuit that or something. There is that, but there's also the opposite, right? There's also very petty reasons for hostility toward these things, right? Um, and they both exist simultaneously, right? So there's just, you know, there's this general thing called tall poppy syndrome that actually exists in a lot of other cultures much more strongly than exists in the USA, although the USA has been picking it up lately, uh, which is just like, look, if somebody next to you is very successful, like they're doing great, even subtracting out any question of like, you know, artistic expression or just th things that might differ from person to person. Just say they're they're obviously being really successful in life and they're happy and they're, you know, they're prosperous and do they have good relationship or whatever. There's a tendency in a lot of places to just tear that person down because it makes you look bad because you could have you could have been prosperous and had a good relationship and like been successful, but, but you weren't. And that implies that the decisions that you're making, which you are so closely identified with, are maybe not the, the best decisions. And people are just inherently very hostile to that. Now, of course, there's a lot of randomness in life too, right? I'm not, I'm not saying people in, in comments that like where you are has no random element. I'm just saying, This is definitely a thing that happens in people's minds and causes them to be hostile to each other. And so there's a version of that <clears throat> that then affects, you know, what what you think about or what you dare talk about. Because, like, if I've decided that there's a ceiling up, that I won't poke my head above, that, like, the job in life is to keep your head down here and kind of duck down and do the things, if somebody else sticks their head above that and says, hey, this thing looks pretty cool over here that I can see. Look at this. Um, that makes you look bad because you didn't do that. Now, again, that's not the only thing going on. It's just it's one ingredient among all these ingredients. And um, it's really. On the one hand, it's unfortunate, but on the other hand, it sort of just is what it is. Right. And. Again, you know, I'm not, I'm not super familiar with the Stoic perspective. It, it never quite was one that super 
appeal to me personally, which also doesn't mean I think it's not good. It's just my my personal track has been a different way. But um, one thing that I believe, w- one idea that I believe that the Stoics would recognize is like, look, man, d- literally everybody could be crazy and doing everything wrong. And in fact, this happens a lot. And like, what do you do if that's the case? You do what you can do. And what you can do might not even be that much. Um, but you do what you can do and you just keep going forward. And hopefully later on, there will be people who appreciate what you did, right? It contributes to what I would describe as like the the idea sophistication problem. You touched on this in the last episode too. And you said that like, as a culture, we seem to be getting simpler in totality in terms of the ideas that we can that we choose to interface with, which invariably leads to inability. You gave a talk called The Collapse of Civilization, and this is actually what prompted me to initially reach out for the very first episode. And in that, you describe how like knowledge is lost over time, and we can see it even in our times with, you give the example of like Texas Instrument chips and stuff, and uh, how there was like some bugs basically w- within the hardware. Uh, and so under those circumstances, it's easy because you gave a concrete example but it does seem like something that you something else you said is that you don't recognize the collapse until it's too late, perhaps, or you don't certainly don't recognize it at the very beginning. Uh, but these are some of the telltale signs, and and it spoke to me because I felt like there's a there's this large contingent, and I don't I mean I don't know what percentages is, but I'm sure there's like this silent group of individuals who are at the very least in the gaming space, but probably just in life in general that have this deep recognition or. Maybe this inarticulated thought that stuff is wrong without needing to be wrong and it could be better, but nobody's trying it. And yeah. finding a way to to sort of navigate that, like you said, is do what you can do. Um, not everybody's going to have the, the call to create something. Not everybody's going to be an artist or a game designer. But if you improve the idea sophistication over time in whatever field you are, that has knock on effects. Um, and so that kind of leads us to AI art. And I'm not sure if you've had, if you've been following it or if you have any thoughts on it immediately as a topic. I mean, it's a very trendy topic and I, it I is, yeah. try to stay away from those <clears throat> by default. Well, what I'll um, hit you with is I feel like it relates directly to like my, my note here says AI art and the apocalypse, which sounds like a weird pairing, but it, it's directly related to this idea sophistication issue because it's saying like it's offloading a creative impulse, but also the technical knowledge and like the objective skill you had to learn in order to create the thing to some black box that even right now, as it is in its inception, nobody understands. Like we can't Mm -hmm. know what all the code that's running is. We would have to reverse engineer it like it was something that we didn't have source access. Well, it's it's not really code is the thing. Right, yeah. Like they... Uh, even the code part of it is too messy and incomprehensible, but, <laughs> yeah. but actually the part that nobody really understands is, you know, the job of the code in this kind of system is actually to be data driven. And so like, you just have this massive amount of data that is like the neural network data mm-hmm. that's essentially controlling what's happening. And yeah, nobody really understands to any reasonable degree what is being caused to happen right by by virtue of this giant process and as this becomes more ubiquitous more democratized if we want to use that word it feels like well the immediate reaction seemed to be oh this is great because now anybody can make art and anybody can generate like fabulous paintings and you know people have hooked it up to a blender with a plug-in and now anybody can generate models and and it's like well yeah but no because they they're not generating it and if that software becomes dominant or even like significant adoption rate, like say 5% of, of the world that is creative is using this in some way, that's still a huge contingent of creatives that aren't actually engaging in creation directly. And so on the one hand, like you were saying about indie developers or small teams being capable, more capable now than they have been before and how that's like a good thing for those who choose to use it, I can see some idea of like, okay, maybe I could use this to bur- lift the art burden. Cause that's the biggest art, the biggest burden that we have right now on the team that hasn't yet been resolved is we don't have like a good artist for modeling and stuff. And we're doing a lot of kit bashes and a lot of placeholders. And we don't know what the path out would that for that would be besides like a painful, slow learning process. And we're willing to do that. 
And maybe the art AI art thing could help with that and make it faster. And that would be a benefit for us, but would it really? And that's sort of like the conundrum that I'm in, right? Is the other hand is, I'm not sure that it would be better for us to not ever learn the skills ourselves and rely on some black box that nobody understands. And what if that changes in some fundamental way? Or what if we can't ever reproduce something? Like say we want to make a, a similar version of something, but it's changed in the neural network side and now we can't reproduce what we got before. And like, you just don't have control. And that's yeah. the biggest concern that I would have with that whole subject, but also on a societal level, and this is a lot of course, but it's like, that's the least sophisticated somebody could be because like you're solving for all of the technological stuff and there's some sophistication in how you feed it a prompt, but that can be solved and maybe that can be AI generated. And like, there's, there might be no end to how automated this whole process becomes. And if there's no human at any part point of this system, then like, how do you ever reproduce this or how do you ever learn something from this or how do you grow and how do you have sophisticated ideas if they're all AI generated? And so I don't know how sophisticated this ends up sounding to you because you probably have a more firm grasp on the technological side of it. And maybe some of the stuff that I'm complain I'm thinking about and prophesizing can't come to pass like logistically, but it feels to me like this is a very dangerous ground to be treading. And it could, if we agree that knowledge lost is leading to a collapse of civilization, this feels like a really quick way to lose a lot of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, here's what, I'll just give you what I think about all these issues, which is, I will say in advance, is not really tied to any kind of definite conclusion. And the reason why is because, look, we're pretty early in whatever this thing is, and it's just very hard to predict things, especially when they're early, right? Um one thing that is very obvious when you use some of these AI art systems is uh, that they don't really know what they're doing, right? It's like they'll make nonsense a lot of the time. So, you know, if you're just, if you're on Twitter or something and you're looking at these cool images that people generated, um, you're like, wow, this is amazing. But if you actually go try it, you know, a lot of the results are really not very amazing. And then once in a while you get something really cool and maybe you learn in this process like how to give prompts that are uh, more likely to to generate good images. But this also, the process of learning how to do this also gives you kind of some clue about what's actually going on, which is that you know, sort of the more words that you put in your prompt that you're giving to the thing, the more you're like um, explicitly reminding it of certain classes of input data that it was trained on, right? And sort of bringing those into uh, consideration for the output. Whereas, you know, if you just say like, you know, cool picture of, of Mickey Mouse riding a surfboard or something, like, you probably don't get something very good out of that, at least so far. I mean, who knows? This is also something people are working on. Um, now, the other thing you notice, and again, this, this is about, the statement I'm about to make is about the current state of things and is certainly one of the things that AI people are, are working on. Whether they will solve it, I don't. I don't know, right? But there is definitely um, in these kind of generated images, there is a lack of coherency that happens, um, unless it's a kind of a coherency that happens because, like, all the images it was trained on were coherent in a certain like way, right? So, like. If a lot of people learn to paint by like copying Thomas Kincaid paintings or something, right? And so that therefore you have a hundred thousand input images that all sort of do a certain thing. Um, then it's pretty easy for one of these systems right now to like give you a, a different variation that that is like that. But um, what I mean by inconsistency is like, you know, if if this image is about 
the reflection of the moon in the water like i don't know that you prompted it with that in some way like <clears throat> to what degree do all of the elements in the image support or detract from that like ostensible point of the image right like the the way the brush strokes are are shaped if it's a painterly emulated thing right like the framing um the the composition of other elements in the scene right um the the thing that we end up seeing is like to the extent that these things end up coming out well in the output of of one of these queries it's because generically they come out well because like everybody on the internet who does all these images or whatever um or not just on the internet but like classically you know because i'm sure they scan all sorts of like media as input to this right but like to the extent that that people understand that the way you lay out this kind of scene is you do the composition in a certain way that can come back out in the output but like you don't really see these things making decisions about composition let's say like like you know not at any level that we understand now again maybe that sort of thing is emergently possible like i I never would say never about that kind of thing, um, especially after the success of, you know, some of these earlier systems like AlphaGo and stuff, where they appear to be able to play quite coherently strategic games of Go, for example. Um, although, again, those are different kinds of systems, too. <laughs> like, those are, you know... Uh, reinforcement by by learning what happens when you play certain ways over an enormous number of games whereas you know these image synthesis kind of systems that we're talking about uh, i haven't played with any of the mesh synthesis ones i assume they're like similar but a little bit worse because you know meshes like there are properties to meshes that you care about besides just how they look like if you're going to render them and use them to cast shadows with and all that stuff that are probably easier to mess up um yeah, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm going to stop rambling and just say um it's early, but um I I definitely what I observe <clears throat> what I observe when I see outputs from this kind of thing is that they are they are matching the requirement in some kind of a way that is you know, is kind of shallow in terms of the meaning of what's in the image, right? It it doesn't, like if you had somebody sit down and try to make you a really high quality image that they really cared about, you would get something better if they were a good artist and tried hard and all these things. Um, but of course, you know, most people don't have the money to pay a good artist who tries hard. And in fact, maybe we don't even have that many of those anymore, um, paradoxically, even though it's easier than ever to be an artist and get training and all this stuff. So where is it going to end up? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe I, so I, I could all, so, so the first thing though, I've just said something that amounts to, I'm not as impressed as some people are with the output of these things. I do want to make clear, technically it is super impressive, right? Um, like, you know, even five years ago, I would have had no reason to believe that you would be able to do what these systems are able to do now technically. So that's a huge advance. But that's different from, like, why do we look at images, right? And what are we getting from what we look at images? And what is the content of the image that we find make, that makes it worth looking at, right? And well I, you know i i don't i don't think it would be reasonable to expect that in the first year when we have these systems that are able to do this on a technical level that they also somehow satisfy some more esoteric deep meaning level of things like I, that's an unreasonable expectation so i observe that they don't do that right now um that doesn't mean that they won't eventually um i don't know well, my so to uh, allay my fears, basically AI would have to find some way to successfully achieve what we're talking about with that esoteric satisfaction. And I just feel like it probably won't ever, which maybe is fallacious, right? Maybe that will bear, bear out as incorrect, but 
also, I don't know how to assign a probability to that. Like if right, I yeah, ask yeah, myself, yeah. I'm betting a hundred dollars. I yeah. don't, I don't know how to bet it. Well, the thing is, if they don't, I feel like even if they do satisfy that, it still is a problem. But if they don't, and we ex still accept the output, broadly speaking, then we lose the sophistication of whatever that esoteric stuff that people can't really put to words anyway is. Like we don't even experience it anymore. And I feel like that, to, to use a term that is probably, or a, a word, phrase that's probably gonna draw ire, we become less human if we don't have access to some way to interface with that aspect of life, of art. If art, if most of the art is going the trend of like Marvel movies and bad yeah. games and whatever else, like pulpy stuff that is not even really like good of its time, but it's, you know, you, you get the idea. If, if that's the direction things are heading and then like we don't even get whatever little shines through from one individual's effort on that team because now there's no yeah. individual, it's an AI. And that becomes a trend in general to use as, as parts. Like another example would be people, the average consumer forgets that when they play a game, it was somebody's job, which they were paid for and ostensibly cared about to assemble every pixel on the screen in some way or shape or form, right? People don't realize that that texture that's really bad and has low textile density relative to everything else was made by a human and placed there by a human. Maybe not the same human, but they, it was all done that way. It, so games already kind of start to feel like they're generated amorphously and people offload that to like, oh, I guess like the company writ large didn't try here. So they like individuals are already sort of out of the picture for most people's understanding if they even think about that critically at all. And so if you get to the point where now it's not true that a human was responsible for assembling all of this stuff, then you can never, and you also take the the principle or the the idea that the, the prediction that AI won't be able to satisfy this esoteric nature then we get to a point where you can't even have like one area of the game that looks like it, somebody really tried. It's all going to look like an AI because it already kind of does is sort of what I'm getting at. And maybe maybe that's not true. Maybe that's contentious that it already kind of does. But I feel like in most games I play, AAA games that are going for this realism uh, angle where they're trying to almost look like an ancestor simulation or look mm -hmm. like real life, they do so, but as soon as there's one thing that's not as good as everything else, it all falls apart. And it's going to be very attractive for game developers and publishers to use some sort of thing that will make the consistent, the, the, all the asset quality as consistent as possible, because that's hitherto been un, like just never seen, right? And so that's something that I do fear for games, but I also think that it extends to other mediums as well. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a flip side of this that actually might come out well. So I agree okay. with you. I agree with you that a lot of games look like they're AI generated, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I was watching the, you know, whatever the new mode for Call of Duty was that, you know, and it's, yeah, like it looks like Call of Duty. Fine. Whatever that means, <clears throat> right? right? Whatever Call there's, of Duty looks like. <clears throat> there's there's very little surprise there in what you see on the screen. I'll right. put it that way, right? Um, but part of the reason that happens, so, you know, there are probably some higher level tools that are being used on these big teams. There's quite a few that are like procedural synthesis kind of tools. Very few of them we would classify yet as the kind of AI that you're talking about, but I, I would expect, it's reasonable to expect that those kind of tools will become much more pervasive in the future, right? But the thing that makes these games generic right now is not even really the use of these automated tools, although I'm sure it helps. It's just that you've got a very large team of people doing a thing and there's like not a lot of voice happening in terms of it, like an opinion of how things should look that's not generic, right? And, and that's just the thing that naturally happens as teams get really big um, and as bu budgets go up, right? Because you could, you could have a creative director that's like, this next Call of Duty is going to be super crazy, man, and and like he'll get fired, right? Um, so, which again, paradoxically, may be part of what's killing this series over time, right? I mean, it still is one of the most successful franchises, but like it's going to die eventually. Um, actually, I don't know if it's still one of the most successful. Right? It's hard hard to say. It also depends on what you're willing to compare the numbers to, like what other kinds of games. But um, so, so the flip side of it 
that might actually be good. But I don't really, I, again, I don't know what probability to ascribe to what I'm about to say, right? But like, okay, if an AI tool lets you do a lot more, and if you have enough control over the output as the person, you know, there's enough dials or there's enough flexibility in the prompt and there's enough reproducibility like you're talking about, because that is important, right? If you are, as the person prompting the generation system, if you have enough control to have expressivity in a reasonable way over what gets generated, and maybe sometimes that just means we generate 50 things and you pick the one that's closest to what you want. Like that's one way of doing this. But <clears throat> that can enable games to be made with by fewer people, which has been the trajectory. Like over the entire history of games, it's been smaller teams have been able to do more. It's just that we counterbalance that by making them huger than ever before, right? And so <clears throat> we keep expanding out as the capabilities keep expanding. Um, but like, if a smaller team can make what today it takes a team five times the size to make, which is not an unreasonable expectation, that just means you get back more flexibility for individuals to have a say in what's in the thing, right? It's no longer like the bank gets to say what the game is. It's like the team gets to say what the game is. And that's one step closer, right? Now, maybe, the dude, at the same time, the reason I don't know how much of a probability to assign to this is like i just got a fucking android phone a few weeks ago that seemed cool it like folds out and has a super big screen and that's nice i cannot type text messages on this phone because the autocorrect is so overzealous it like changes entire sentences for like one character typos and there's no mode to put into it that's like fix only the one character typos right and so i just have autocorrect turned completely off and it's the most frustrating experience it's like why is this so bad right so we seem to be even with simple stuff like that we seem to be terrible at designing it um so like why do i think we can design these more complicated systems to be more amenable to expressivity right it's um like again to go rant about spell check because i use ios spell check as well for years like it's so pompous it doesn't even give you a thing that says undo this thing i just changed it's like literally just changes it and says fuck you if you don't like that delete the last three words you typed and type them again and then it fucking changes it again like you have to do it three times sometimes it's like we're so bad at simple like characters in a row like why do i think that we're going to be better at you know generating meshes for a 3d game i don't know but we'll see it's an interesting conundrum um and and certainly watch this space i guess uh to to sort of close us off i wanted to ask yeah. you i wanted to read you a quote in two parts and you can tell me what you think about it so maybe you'll have a some insight or maybe it'll just be like oh yeah that's true so uh the first part of the quote is the industry has bypassed their responsibility to the consumer and the second part of the quote is, the consumer has accepted, willfully or unwittingly, substandard products as the status quo. Is that a quote I'm supposed to recognize? No, no, not necessarily. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I don't um, even remember the author. I would just have it written down because it spoke to me. Here's a thing that that reminds me of. And I don't remember, it's it's from a book by one of two authors. One of them is Benjamin R. Barber, who wrote this book. Uh, well, he, he wrote a number of things about infantilization of culture over time. I, I don't know if it was him. I think it might have been Paul Fussell, who's actually an, an essayist who writes a bunch of stuff. I think it was Paul Fussell. But, but anyway, he's talking about how actually... Um, technological process over progress over time has inherently been about giving more people lower quality products so for example back in the days when like most people owned like one shirt 
because it was incredibly expensive or something, right? If you were a well-to-do person who could afford to have a wardrobe of the size that people would have today, or even smaller, half the size of what people would have today, you would go to a tailor, right? He would make the clothes for you. They would like fit you very well. And um, you would have a little bit more choice over the exact cuts and all these things, right? And and so what what was the evolution of clothing? Well, is it that everybody goes to the tailor and has their clothes made? No, it's you go to the store and it's like, here's some shirts. They come in small, medium, or large, or extra large, or whatever. And none of these really fit you exactly, right? And, you know, they're all mass produced and whatever. And this is strictly inferior to what the well-to-do person had in the past. And so on the one hand, we're much richer than that person is because we have all this stuff. But on the other hand, any individual piece of the stuff um, um, that has a direct analog to what existed back then is probably worse. Like, of course, we've invented lots of stuff that's like better, right? So like I have a cool electric car that's way better than like a horse and carriage would have been. But but for things where you see the exact analogy, they're usually worse, right? Um, and that's just part of, like, the way that we have solved these problems is with scale. And scale means you don't get exactly what you want, or this is not even for you exactly, right? And this comes up all the time, even in, like, software and stuff. So, like, there's this thing that, I don't know if you use it, but is this thing Microsoft Visual Studio that like <laughs> is a compiler and a debugger that's been around since the 1990s that like most people in the games industry who program in C++ use this. And it's really bad in a lot of ways. And Microsoft has a team working on it all the time. And like the stuff they add to it is like ridiculous, stupid bullshit that probably they're convinced somebody cares about, but that like nobody in the games industry cares about certainly and then meanwhile other things about like it's getting slower all the time and buggier and whatever and when you raise this issue i might have even said this in the collapse of civilization talk but um when, when you raise this issue people will say like well it's not for you exactly it's for this entire industry of programmers that originally was C++ programmers, but now it's like there's more C-sharp programmers and C++ programmers and all this stuff. So it's for all these people. So of course it doesn't target your needs. But <laughs> that's just like an example of this same phenomenon where it's like, oh, yeah, as we're scaling these things up, they actually become worse for me personally. For any individual, pick any random individual who's in the customer base and it's actually worse for them but somehow in aggregate it's the thing that we're making right um maybe that's also why rts has died i don't know um but uh yeah I don't, that's just what that quote reminded me of is and i don't um it, it's not like i have any answer to this i mean if anything what i do right as an independent game designer is make things that are intentionally not targeting the largest scale of audience, right? And so maybe that's a way to bring some quality back. Like, I am not at all surprised if a lot of people don't like The Witness because it's like not that much like a lot of other games. That's fine. It's a very deliberate choice that we made. Um, like you were saying, you know, you don't, as a small team, you don't need to make all the money in the world. Like quite reasonable levels of success actually are very good when you have a small team. Um, and so I think um, that's one way of bringing quality back into the world, right? Um, but even with something like The Witness, right? Like, I don't know, I actually don't know. It, it, if you exclude piracy and just like how many people actually paid for the game, it's in the millions. It might, it might be as high as 10 million. I don't know. Cause there's a lot of like discount copies and stuff, right? Like bundle copies. And then by the time you add piracy, it's like way higher than that. But, um, that's actually quite a, a large scale mass production operation when you're talking about 10 million. Right. And so, 
how much more what is possible in the world of like bespoke game design where you make something really for a smaller group um i don't know right maybe the way out is through specifically mm -hmm. designing uh, games or tools for yourself that are are earmarked for particular purposes, particular crowds. Certainly, a, a philosophy I've adopted lately is that there's going to be a, fa a probably sizable faction of people who are aware of the product and don't like it because of certain design decisions, and it's not for them, right? In some capacity, and and maybe that's why, as you were saying, the scaling up of everything means that you're necessarily casting as wide a net as possible, and also necessarily like, I mean, there's a programming. I, I guess truism that is generalized <laughs> solutions suck in a very specific cases for solving very specific yeah. problems. Right. So that's what yeah. unreal engine is. It's a generalized solution, but if you're trying to do something very specific, you might not be able to do it. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's a, I think it's a, a nice little bit of uh, I would say wisdom to, to anybody who's designing something is probably find a target and, and hit that target and worry less about hitting as many targets as possible so but then again to go to go to the flip side so <clears throat> i sort of focused on one aspect of the topic being brought up by the, that quote <clears throat> but i think another aspect that's there and which we maybe already talked about some tonight is just or today it's dark in here so mentally it's night for me um is just yeah like culturally we seem to be in this feedback loop where things that are not that sophisticated are more successful because you don't have to try as hard to enjoy them or whatever, right? Um, and then because those things are more successful, they're what we see in volume. And then they're what we train ourselves on and what we train our kids on, right? And so like a Marvel movie like is kind of the definition of a movie now, which is pretty weird. Like that wasn't even true when I was in college or whatever. Um, so it happened, in fact, it wasn't even true, I don't know, in like 2005, I want to say, right? Like, so somehow this happened relatively quickly. Um, and I, I, that feels to me like it has pretty big consequences, you know, like, I, I don't think that you can do things at that scale and they don't have consequences. So... Again, you know, maybe the role of the independent creator is to provide some kind of alternative to that mentality, right? Um, and yeah, like that's, that's to me, that's part of keeping the medium alive because there is, so <laughs> one of the people, um, uh, Back in that Collapse of Civilization talk, um, one of the people I, I referred to a speech from is this guy named Samo Borya, who I since came to know in, in real life. Um, he has a bunch of interesting material. And one of the essays that you can look up that's pretty short read, but a useful way to think around about the world is, I believe it's called Live Versus Dead Players. Or if you search for that phrase, you'll find it. I don't, I don't know if it's actually the title. But, you know, in there he talks about, okay, there's this thing where we're in this world, the world, I'm paraphrasing extremely, and this is, this is my understanding of what he said as opposed to what he actually wrote. But like, look, we're in this world that there's all sorts of contexts that you could be acting in, and these contexts have obvious incentive structures, right? And so, for example, why do we get all those Marvel movies? And they're exactly the same movie and all this stuff, right? Well, because that's just what looks like the winning strategy. There might be an even more winning strategy that nobody's discovered yet, but that looks like the winning strategy to being a, a movie-making entity in the year 2022, right? Is like we've there's there's certain there's all these dynamics about like what are people interested in in seeing and how much does it cost to put a movie in theaters and like where does the revenue come from and you, you know what percentage should be special effects versus not like all whatever it's hugely complicated right and so that determines this incentive structure and so game theoretically uh there's just the right things to do given that structure right like oh i, I want to make money 
let me do this thing. And and that's true everywhere. Like there's political structures, just everything. And the thing is, if you only ever act according to exactly those incentives, then there's no surprise to anything that you do. So if you imagine that you're a player in an RTS, and this actually happens in in like um, poker and and chess and stuff, even sometimes, right? Like if I'm just playing according to what we all understand is, well, the doctrine or the the incentive structure says that I should do this, therefore I'm going to do this. You as my opponent actually can take advantage of me now because you know what the fuck I'm going to do in any given circumstance, right? And so now you can be a shark who's actually in theory playing non-optimally because you're not totally paying attention to the rules of what you're supposed to do when. But because I'm being a robot, because I'm acting according to these rules that have been figured out, you can exploit my behavior and get me to do things that will cause you to win, right? And so um, Samo calls that a, a dead player, essentially, which is like a person or usually an organization that has sort of found its niche and it's found a way to operate in such a way that um, is successful. Uh, but in a sense is successful only in the presence of other dead players, right? Because a live player who can like step up and see the rule set and see what you're doing can like eat your lunch, right? And so in this framework, there's an aspiration in some sense to to always be the live player, right? The person who's willing to see the incentive structure and be willing to step out of it or do something non-obvious or non non-local, like, Maybe I'm going to ignore this large set of incentives because I'm playing for some other incentive that people are not, um, people are too short-sighted to see or too scared to to play stakes that long term or or whatever. It's it's a really interesting essay. I'm sure what I said literally has very little to do with what he actually said, but um, definitely worth reading. Um, but I think about it in you know in this kind of a context, like okay. Another way to say, because I think I've said before in speeches that like as as an independent developer with a small budget, like actually the power that you have is the power to risk losing money because it's not that bad if your budget is not that big. Right. Whereas if you're like, you know, if you made a movie for four hundred million dollars, that's really bad if you lose four hundred million dollars. Right. Um, so that's the power that people have. But another way to say that is just like, look, you can be a live player pretty easily and do things that are not the script of what somebody in your position is supposed to be able to do. And that's actually very powerful. Um, and and coincidentally or not, it's also a great way to feel like you're living life well and to have self-respect. and. And, you know, to, to believe that what you're doing is, is meaningful, right? So, I don't know. Live versus dead players. Good answer. It's a, I can imagine it's a, an evolution on the pithy quote of the master swordsman needs only to fear the man who's never picked up a sword. It's like if you can be the man who never picked up a sword, but you have studied how the other people got to mastery and you can now mm-hmm. find a way to expose the fact that they expect certain things. That's when that's where like the live versus dead players kind of comes to fruition. So yeah, th- definitely something I'm going to go read after this and I'll have a link in yeah. the description too, to once I go find it. Right. So anybody else can, if grab you it. can't find it, let me know and I'll dig it up, but I'm pretty sure it should be easy to find. There you go. Well, yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, certainly looking forward to talking more with you about so- your Sokoban style game, which we didn't end up getting to after all. But that's yeah. that's all right because the By the way, I want to apologize to anyone like cuz I realize this is the third time I've been on maybe some of the cultural ranting that I did. I feel like maybe we did that before and it's repetitive. Um I don't know. I don't know how much of it was new and how much of it was old, but Well, there's the Sorry, context of the conversation and yeah. I think it helped to I mean, there's going to be people who click on this and this is the first time they've seen us together. So, there's also that and yeah. so it's it's useful as a responsibility. I mean, it's been a few months since the last episode anyway. I think I think mm-hmm. it went well and I'm I'm really grateful for uh, you spending your time and I whenever part 4 is, uh we will definitely get to talking more about what you're in the doldrums with working right now in the moment. So, doldrums is not the right word, but <laughs> yeah, definitely uh working hard on for sure there you go all right well until next time then yeah